Hi, my name is Arisa Ugo. I'm the author of The Smart Money Woman and The Smart Money Tribe, and also the producer of the TV show called The Smart Money Woman, now streaming. You're watching my cover on Accelerate TV. I'm Arise, I'm a Bini girl, very proud of it. Even if I can't speak Bini to save my life, I can only say, Lare Awatota, but <laughs> I'm very proud of my heritage um, and I think that this shows in my work. I'm also very passionate about personal finance as regards the African millennial and I guess Gen, Gen Z woman. Um, a lot of the work that I do is basically about breaking down financial jargon in a way that the everyday person can understand. And I do this through entertaining content. So with the book, it was a huge thing for me when um, you know talking about personal finance and wanting, wanting to put out work that African women actually connect to. Because when I was trying to figure out my own personal finances, I was working in investment management, and I was around 27 years old, and I was basically trying to figure out my personal finances, even if I worked in finance. And I found that a lot of the content was about solving the student debt loan problem, credit card um, issues, things that didn't really pertain to, you know, how we interacted with money in Africa. Because um, we have a debt problem, but no one's giving you student loans. Um, in Nigeria and I wanted to create content that was entertaining, interesting and relatable um, as it pertains to African millennial women and so I started thinking how do I create stories around, relatable stories around strong African women in a way that they're not usually like portrayed and their pain points with money and that's how Smart Money Woman was birthed there's Zuri, Lara, Ladu, Adesua, all doing different sorts of careers and all dealing with different pain points that many African women can relate to as regards financial abuse, entrepreneurship, um, intrapreneurship, how to deal with money conversations with your tribe, how to deal with money conversations with your um, spouse and things of that nature. And the book became really popular and I went on a book tour across Africa to countries like Tanzania, Uganda, Mozambique, um, South Africa, to name a few. And then I had the crazy idea of turning this book into a TV series. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it was one of the hardest things I've ever had the pleasure of doing in my life, but it was I say this with trepidation now. It was good fun, and I'm about to repeat it again. Well, I go through obstacles like everyone else. Um, obstacles with regards to finding capital, to pursue the projects that you want to, building a team that's skilled, um, getting people to take your ideas seriously. But I think my motto in life is just, you know, do your best. Don't think about who has done it before and it didn't work out. So don't think about who is a naysayer. Just keep going regardless of the circumstances in the country because no matter how much we complain, there's still people who are making money. Um, <laughs> and I think that women need to you know, focus on what they're good at, how they can monetize the things that they're good at. Because one thing for you to be passionate is another thing for you to be resilient, you know, enough to overcome the obstacles that are going to indefinitely be in your way, whether you're in Nigeria, whether you're anywhere else. Even if I will say, the obstacles in Nigeria are a bit different. They prepare you for, like, they prepare you for war. I feel like if you're a Nigerian entrepreneur, um, you wake up in the morning ready to eat problems for breakfast. And if you're a Nigerian entrepreneurial woman, those problems are probably 
twice the size, um, you know, for men. But in the spirit of International Women's Day and, you know, breaking the bias, I think it's important for us to also think about um, the economic impact that women have when it comes to just everything in general. Leaving women out of the conversation or women not being a part of the conversation and not having economic power, I think, you know, limits us. So I'd love for the focus to be on economic empowerment for women as opposed to just fighting for a seat at the table. How do we make money? How do we invest more money? How are we decision makers in the places that matter? Mm, I'm just trying to think about what is most important to me or whether it's a skill or a value. But I think one, resilience. I think that resilience is really important. Um, because, like I said before, you're going to face so many obstacles and if, it's great to have an idea, but it's another thing to be someone who can actually execute it. And when you're coming from a developed country, you know, like Nigeria, there are lots of things that are not, you know, spelled out. There are lots of, like, journeys that you're going to start and you're the first to do it the way that you're doing it. So you have to be prepared for the obstacles. And I think that when, you know, you're in that mindset where it's like, I have a vision, no matter what happens between point A and point B, I'm going to make sure that that vision is executed. So it doesn't matter what obstacles come your way, your resilience sort of gets you through it. So I guess that's one. Um, the ability to bring people together. I think it's important, you know, as a leader on any project or, you know, anything that you're doing to be able to sell your vision or your idea to all the different stakeholders. And that's a big part of, you know, getting anything done. Bring people together in terms of like your team that you're going to work with, bring people together in terms of like investors. You need to be able to articulate yourself in a way that helps you stand out. So why should these people work with you as opposed to working with other people? Why should investors put their capital with you as opposed to um, putting it in you know, another idea? So I think it's important for you to know how to articulate your vision and know how to sell it to um, the different stakeholders. I struggle to answer that question because um, I think it's something, I feel like it's a muscle that you build. I don't know that anyone can be born with resilience, but I think that it's a muscle that you can learn and you can grow, right? Um, but I do think that, I know that I've said this a hundred times, but I feel like it's important to say. <laughs> I do feel like you start to learn about resilience from a very young age when you're from a developing country because you start to experience the obstacles a little bit earlier, you know, than most people. You start to experience, you know, not getting the things that you set out to do or, you know, different setbacks and how you deal with those setbacks, I guess, helps to build your resilience. the one I hate the most is the one where every time a woman does well in this part of the world there always seems to be this notion or this narrative that she couldn't have done it without a man right so either she came from a family where she got it it was inherited or she slept with someone to get there and in as much as I appreciate that um, we live in an environment where that is normal, I think it's important to also show women that that is not, you know, the only way, or to show men as well that that is not the only way. That there are lots of women who can be resourceful, who can climb, you know, the ladder without doing the things that they accuse them of. So I think a lot of my work is also showing the alternative um, routes that women can take when it comes to spending, when it comes to investing, you know, and, you know, when it comes to basically building something that actually matters. Well, the next chapter for Small Money Woman is well, we're working on season two at the moment, and the goal is to pursue all the relevant topics um, that concern women, African women in this 
um, season. So one is definitely crypto and you know the crypto craze and how you know women are interacting or not interacting with it the level of risk that they're willing to take um, and not take um, is going to explore a lot of things in my second book like financial abuse um, in marriages you basically get to see the girls on a new level dealing with new devils Um, I think in general, I'd love to see more women occupy um, positions that are decision-making positions, especially when it comes to the money. The women who are actually signing the checks and making decisions about the checks. Because it's all well and good for women to rise in you know, professions where they're in charge of the storytelling and managing human capital. Um, but I think that we need to be at the table when it comes to discussing checks. Um, <laughs> let's shake this table because I know it's International Women's Day and we're all about women supporting women um, and we're not supposed to talk about women not supporting women but I'd like to bring this to the forefront. Now in my experience and I think that it's important for us to start having these conversations because in a lot of my journey I am a product of women who have supported me. Right. I've been, I'm a product of women who have spoken my name in rooms and given me opportunities um, over the years. But I've also experienced the other side of it, which a lot of young girls ask me all the time. Like I said, oh my God, you're so lucky um, because you have these people um, supporting you. You had these people mentor you, right? Um, and they feel not seen because they feel like my own experience is completely different from yours, Arisa. I've been in situations where women have not supported me. In fact, they've been the obstacle to my progress. Um, and in as much as I think that we need to change the narrative, I think it's important for us to talk about the things that are not really spoken of, which is sometimes the woman that can give you the opportunity might be you know, the top boss. But you get there and there are lots of women in middle management who act as the obstacle to your progress. And I've never understood it, but I feel like there's a lot of cultural sort of like bias that plays into this. So for example, let's say you're going out for a contract and you're young, maybe you're in your mid twenties and they feel like the um, money that you're asking for is too much. Too much based on what? I've been told before, Oh, but you're not a man now. <laughs> you're not a man, what do you need all this money for? Hello? I don't understand. Or, you know, or she likes, or she's too young. Why should we give her um, this position? Or the contract is too big. Meanwhile, when they're, when they're assigning, um, or when they're assessing a man for the same exact thing, they don't have these issues. In fact, they're speaking to the men. I've been in meetings where I definitely ask a man to be part of the meeting because I know that the woman in the meeting might be a little bit nicer to him because he's a guy. So I think that it's important for us to really look at, look at ourselves and ask every day when you're going to work, when you're running your business, am I a woman who is supporting other women? Or am I a woman who is making myself, you know, an obstacle because I feel like not talking about it doesn't make the problem um, better. We need to be able to show both sides um, and overcome both sides. Um, if I'm going to be honest, I wrote the book from a millennial perspective. Um, but I find that a lot of women, Gen Z women, have also like really bought into the idea of becoming a smart money woman. Um, and then they see, they find the characters relatable, um, they find the stories relatable. I think it might be a, a little bit different for, from Gen Z because I'm actually going through a really interesting season now where I'm like 
hmm, now I know what it feels like when, you know, the older generation was like, ah, you millennials, you're so fearless. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're so fearless, you just do things, you just go for it. Now I'm looking at like Gen Z girls and be like, wow, go on with your bad self. Like, you're so fearless. Like, you're not even, you know, thinking about what can fail or, you know, what could go wrong. Like, you're just going for it. Um, so I think it's, they're, they're different demographics, but I think that they're both buying into the whole idea of um, the small money woman and making smarter choices. But I do think that the um, Gen Z generation are way more, like, fearless when it comes to attacking projects or taking on you know big projects or big roles. I feel like millennial women were we questioned things but respectfully. We questioned things but like eh, don't let it shake the foundations of what I've been taught like for a long time, right? But I like I love the Gen Z um, generation because they make me question things as well. Like, so sometimes when you see something that is like super crazy or feels so like out there, like how dare this person say this? But actually, how dare they not? And why did we not say something or speak up like sooner? Um, so I definitely love it. I think that a lot of the things that say like Adesua, one of the characters in my book or in the show, um, goes through. A lot of Gen Z women would have been like, Psh, hell no, that is not happening. But a lot of the, the women in my generation could find themselves in that position because of where we are trapped mentally in terms of what a woman should be and shouldn't be and what um, constitutes success as a woman, whether you have a big career or not. Financial independence is the goal. Um, whether it's, you know, with your craft, I believe that women need to be paid for what they do. I think it's not just great to be passionate about something or we're taught, oh, find your passion and you'll never you know, work a day in your life. But I feel like it's important for you to find, be passionate about whatever feeds you. Um, yeah, financial independence. So it's great to be passionate about something, but not just passionate, but figure out how you're going to monetize um, the thing. It's great to spend and look amazing. Um, I have an expensive wardrobe, but on the other side of it, have assets that can protect you in the future. So it's about finding a balance, not you know coming from a place of lack, but coming from a place of abundance. How can I make more money? How can I spend and invest you know more effectively? As opposed to don't spend money, um, wait till you, do, as opposed to extremes, don't spend money um, at all, wait till you blow before you start investing. Um, I think a small money woman, regardless of um, generations, is focused on financial independence, is, focusing, is focused on making sure that they're monetizing their craft, and is focused on economic empowerment for other women regardless of whether they're Gen Z or millennial. How do I serve the women that are around me um, that help and help them to live their best lives as well? Thank you for watching my cover on Accelerate TV. My name is Arisa Ogun.